You're listening to episode 5 of The Star Spot for Friday, May 18, 2012. I'm Justin Trottier, and I'll be your host at The Star Spot. The Star Spot is a space themed podcast that focuses on all aspects of astronomy and space exploration. Episodes feature interviews with guests of wide ranging backgrounds scientists, engineers, educators, artists, politicians, and business people. Topics are similarly broad, from the latest space mission to how the universe began, from why humans explore to how we can make exploration economical. We'll also include a segment called Current in Space bringing you reports on news and developments that may interest the space enthusiast. Our feature interview today is with J. M. Pasikoff. He'll be preparing us for the upcoming Transit of Venus, your last chance to catch this unique event for over a hundred years. But first, here's what's current in space. As if dark matter weren't mysterious enough, two discoveries seem to contradict what little we thought we knew. First, there is the discovery of a structured wall of satellite galaxies and globular clusters surrounding the Milky Way. Dubbed the vast polar structure, the objects composing the wall are arranged in a flat area extending for millions of light years above and below our galaxy. But if the wall formed from the accumulation of separate objects captured by the gravity of our galaxy, as current dark matter theories predict, astronomers wouldn't be seeing the structure so well ordered. Instead, observations suggest these objects formed from a single event, such as the collision of two galaxies. And as if that weren't bad enough, a second, perhaps even more troubling study has found no trace at all of the elusive dark matter in or near our own solar system. Dark matter should be in the neighborhood. Its absence is hard to reconcile with expectations for dark matter existing in halos surrounding, but also permeating galaxies. To account for such discrepancies, a new theory has already emerged. Perhaps dark matter is something entirely different, something far more mundane than we thought. What about planets? That's the thinking of N. Chandra Wickramasinghe, an astronomer from the University of Buckingham. With international collaborators, Wickramasinghe has argued for increasing the predicted number of potential free-floating planets in the galaxy from a mere few billion to a few hundred thousand billion. Not only does he believe these rogue objects could account for the missing mass of galaxies that dark matter is typically brought in to explain, but in such a scheme one of these planets would be expected to visit our inner solar system about once every 26 million years. These ancient worlds, possibly originating from as far back as a few million years after the Big Bang, might even act as vessels dispersing the seeds of life between planets. The company Space Exploration Technologies, more commonly called SpaceX, has lofty ambitions to prove the commercial space industry can take over some of the heavy lifting from government. Picking up on its success of December 2010, when it sent the first commercially built cargo capsule into orbit and returned it safely, SpaceX now aims to get an unmanned capsule to dock with the International Space Station. The scheduled launch on Saturday, May 19th of the Dragon capsule via its Falcon 9 booster was cancelled at the very last second, just after the booster had begun firing. The cause was an onboard computer reading slightly high combustion chamber pressure in one of the engines. This is but a minor disappointment. The company itself predicted only a 50-50 chance of success on the first go, and launch will merely be postponed to Tuesday. Dragon will carry a thousand pounds of scientific equipment, food and other supplies to the ISS. The goal is proof of concept. Other companies entering the commercial space business, like Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, as well as smaller players from North America, Europe, and elsewhere, are watching closely. They see this as an opportunity to show NASA that the private sector can take over the transportation into orbit of cargo and eventually even astronauts. Already, SpaceX has a $1.6 billion contract with NASA for 12 flights to haul cargo to the station. By outsourcing some space missions in this way, NASA hopes to better focus on other aspects of its mandate. Dragon is scheduled to return to Earth carrying cargo back from the ISS two weeks after docking. In other private space industry news, a team of entrepreneurs have joined to create Planetary Resources Inc. with a focus on the eventual mining of minerals from asteroids. Planetary Resources, which is being backed by Google CEO Larry Page, 
Microsoft billionaire Charles Simone, and Ross Perot Jr., is starting to study mechanisms for extracting prized minerals like platinum and gold from nearby asteroids. While space mining is a decade out, Canada, a mining world leader, has plans well underway. The Canadian Space Agency and the Northern Centre for Advanced Technology, or NORCAT, a nonprofit based in Sudbury, Canada, are already considering the role of mining, both for bringing back material to Earth and for in situ resource utilization as humans explore space. As far back as 2000, NORCAT began working on developing mining drills for use in space. Its drills are expected to be incorporated into future lunar missions, now that recent discoveries have hinted at large amounts of water ice a meter below the surface of the moon. The role of resource extraction is critical to long-duration human space missions. Life support systems in today's spacecraft can only sustain life for a few days, and it's far cheaper to use local resources than to transport them from Earth. And now on to the main event, which, unless you expect to be alive in 105 years, you won't want to miss. It's coming up very soon on June 5th and 6th, and it's our focus today on the star spot. I'm talking, of course, about the transit of Venus. The appeal of this unique phenomenon has really bridged the gap between art and science. It was the basis for the 1883 Transit of Venus March, written for a military brass band to commemorate the transit of 1882. It was also the basis of a play by Canadian playwright Maureen Hunter, which itself was turned into an opera. Called simply The Transit of Venus, the play and the opera center on the expedition of the 18th century French astronomer Guillaume Le Gentil de la Galassière, whose goal was to use the transit to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun. The six-hour crossing of Venus across the face of the Sun will be best visible from the Pacific Ocean. Most of North America and northwestern South America will see the transit start before sunset. Southern Asia, Eastern Africa, Western Australia, and most of Europe will be able to see the end of the transit as the sun rises. More information and details about local events near you are available at the website venustransit.nasa.gov. One man who will be making the most of this event is renowned Transit of Venus Authority Jay Pasikoff. Pasikoff has an article in the May 2012 issue of Physics World exploring the history and science of transits. J. M. Pasikoff is the director of the Hopkins Observatory, as well as chair of the Astronomy Department and Field Memorial Professor of Astronomy at Williams College. He comments frequently on the status of astronomy and science education, and is the author of textbooks in astronomy, physics, mathematics, and various other sciences. Professor Pasikoff, can we start by uh, just explaining to me w what brings you to Toronto? I've worked for a long time with Professor John Percy from the University of Toronto. He was the president of the Committee, for Research, the, the committee on Education and Development of the International Astronomical Union. I was the U.S. representative and then I eventually followed him as an officer. Uh, and he asked me to come to participate in a Transit of Venus symposium this weekend. We had a, a wonderful group of people speaking yesterday about a, a astonishing variety of things to do with the forthcoming transit of Venus and some of the historical aspects. You talk, let's start with the historical aspects. How long has the transit of Venus been a known phenomenon in the sky? The history goes back to Johannes Kepler, perhaps my favorite astronomer, who in 1609 worked out the first two of his laws of planetary orbits. Mm -hmm. uh, with the ideas of Copernicus from the 16th century, it's only Venus and Mercury that can go between the Earth and the Sun, and Kepler predicted a transit of Venus for 1631. Nobody saw it. It was only in the New World that it would have been visible, and they didn't have any telescopes right. here in 1631. But he also predicted a transit of Mercury, which was seen, so we thought he was uh, on the right track. But, but uh, he had died by that time, and there was no specific prediction for the future, so the the future belonged at that time to a very young man uh, in his early 20s named Jeremiah Horrocks. He looked over uh, Kepler's tables and found that there was going to be another transit in 1639. And he and one person he wrote to were the only people in the world to, to see that one back then. So the first transit of Mercury was actually seen during Kepler's lifetime, but not the Well, first. no, it was also a year after he died, but okay. it was seen from his prediction whereas the transit of Venus was not seen from his prediction, it was seen from Jeremiah Horrocks' prediction. What year would that have been? That it was 1639. 1639. Okay. It turns out, now that we know how to predict things very accurately, the transits of Venus come in pairs separated mm -hmm. by eight years, 
and then there's a gap of either 105 and a half or, uh, or 120 and a half years before the next pair. Can you explain why they come in pairs? The way I like to think of it is Venus going round and round, and every once in a while it passes in front of the Sun. And so one time it passes on the bottom half of the Sun, the next time it goes around and it passes on the top half of the Sun, and the next time it goes even higher, and then each time it comes around, uh, every eight years it goes higher and higher and higher, and it takes uh, over 100 years for it to go all the way around and come back around the bottom again. Interesting. Does Mercury have anything similar? Mercury does something similar. Mercury goes around the sun faster than Venus because it's further in. Uh, and there are um, over a dozen transits of Mercury per century. Okay. But, uh, and there's some science that we've done with Mercury. We've seen some of these effects with Mercury. Uh, but Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. And we're trying to learn how to study atmospheres. We're interested in our own Earth's atmosphere, of course. Uh, Venus is a planet the same size as Earth, though a little closer to the Sun, and, and it winds up being much hotter as a result. Mm -hmm. We now have these thousands of probable planets around other stars, exoplanets they're called, and some fraction of them will have atmospheres, and there's an understandable curiosity to learn what those atmospheres are like, and whether some of them might have atmospheres like ours, uh, even. So it's more interesting to study Venus than to study Mercury. And you can gather information from the atmospheres of Venus and even exoplanets from the data from the transits? Yes, that's just a great thing. Uh, I only learned about transits of Venus a dozen years ago. It's not a common phenomenon. There was really no mm -hmm. reason for people to know about it when, when it wasn't happening. Right. Um, but uh, we were interested at that time in understanding just what the transit looked like. There was something called the black drop effect that confused people at the beginning and the end of the transit. And a colleague and I looked at some space observations of a transit of Mercury, were able to solve what explained the black drop. But I wanted to see it myself. I worked on it, why, why not go see it? And in 2004, when the transit came, uh, we had arranged for some spacecraft observations, but we also wanted to see it in person. I was able to get support from the Committee for Research and Exploration of the National Geographic Society. And I took uh, a half dozen students from Williams College uh, and some colleagues to Greece where the whole transit was going to be visible instead of only a bit of it mm -hmm. here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we did see it. Uh, but the most interesting thing was when the space results came down the atmosphere of Venus had become visible about 20 minutes before Venus went in silhouette against the sun. Mm. And we just weren't expecting that. If you look back, there were some reports uh, going back hundreds of years. Uh, some were inaccurate. They, they don't match what we now know uh, we saw. And, uh, and some, especially from, from the 1874-1882 transit, uh, were accurate. Uh, but uh, it's just very interesting to see the sliver of atmosphere. As Venus is half in, the part that sticks out, like an ear, has a little rim of light around it. And that turns out to be Venus's atmosphere bending the sunlight toward us. So in this transit that's coming up on June 5th, we're really concentrating our efforts on studying uh, this atmosphere. We have access to telescopes that have devices, spectrographs to look at the atmosphere in Sacramento Peak, New Mexico, filters to study the atmosphere in space, and uh, where I will be in Haleakala in, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and we're viewing this as an analog to the observations that are increasingly being made of these exoplanets around distant stars, some of which have atmospheres that are bending and focusing the star's light toward us. This black drop effect? Yes. Well, what did it turn out to be? Well, the black drop effect, let me say first, I think of uh, looking like taffy. When Venus goes into the sun, you would expect the black silhouette of Venus to, to be visible against the, the bright disk of the sun. Right. But it turned out that even when Venus was a little bit inside, it was linked, the black silhouette was linked to the outside by something that looked a little bit like taffy that then pulled for a while, for about a minute, and then popped. Mm, and and, uh, and it, it, it 
confused people who wanted to time the the moment of Venus entering uh, by a very accurate measurement to about a second of time, and but the black drop meant that everything was inaccurate to about a minute of time. And Edmund Halley had given a, a way of finding out how big the solar system was, which was the universe then, how big the solar system, the universe was in, in real units, uh, such as what we would now use miles. Um, and the method depended on accurate timing. So the fact that this timing was inaccurate because of the black drop really was a major confusion in astronomy for hundreds of years. So it turned out when we analyzed it, we were able to analyze it because we had the spacecraft observations from NASA's Transition Region and Coronal Explorer, TRACE spacecraft, that one of the causes was something that, that was suspected, just that any size telescope is inherently a little blurry. So there's a little blurriness just because you're, you're viewing the telescope, a point doesn't come out as exactly a point. But what we found that was a surprise was that an effect that basically comes from the idea that the sun is a ball of gas. It doesn't have a sharp edge. Uh, because the sun doesn't have a sharp edge, we only think it has a sharp edge because when you're looking past it, the angle between looking past it clearly and, and seeing the edge is a very small angle. And just in that little bit of angle, it turns out the sun is getting darker so drastically, just because it's this semi-transparent gas, um, that it interacts with the blurriness to make the black drop effect. That's called limb darkening. The edge of the sun or a star is called its limb. So if you take a picture of the sun, and you can see this clearly on the pictures that we have, just with a normal telephoto camera from the ground, that the, uh, the, that the sun is just brighter in its center than it is near the edge. And the ones during the transit show this nice black dot of, uh, of Venus on it. But people hadn't really appreciated how drastically that limb darkening occurs just in that little bit where the black drop is seen. And, and, and now we can model with our computer and subtract those effects, and you can see that, that then we have a very clear separation. So we, we've explained it entirely now. This is what's fascinating to me, is that from a seemingly simple event, the transit of Venus, you can get information about the sun, you can get information about the atmosphere of Venus, you can use that data to understand better atmospheres of exoplanets. Um, is there any, any other fascinating insights into the solar system or beyond the solar system that we get from a seemingly simple transit event? Well, in a, in a secondary way, it turns out that by having a disk of known size and, and known timing outside the Earth's atmosphere, you can calibrate your telescopes and see how clearly your telescopes are seeing things. Hmm. Um, so when Mercury or Venus uh, goes across some features on the Sun, we know how fast they're moving, we know exactly how big they are, we know what scattering there is inside the telescope. And so there have been some studies of the, uh, of the telescopes themselves that then goes back and helps you understand all the other observations of all the other objects in the universe that, say, the Hubble Space Telescope or some of the solar te uh, telescopes are, are making. You do a lot of very, uh, very interesting astronomy in some, in some broad areas that was interesting to, uh, to do my research uh, on your work. Uh, you're looking at planets, you're looking at moons, you're looking at the, uh, the concentration of deuterium and, and its implications for our understanding of cosmology. Um, how, how do you choose which of these fascinating areas to go into? Well, they all had a common thread and they all, in, in my life, led one thing to another. Um, I was, uh, many years ago, um, well, to, to be honest about it, I was avoiding going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1969, the um, a, a colleague of mine uh, got, uh, who was in the same situation in graduate school, uh, got a couple of jobs. He was thinking more about it than I was, and he took one and passed the other on to me, and it turned out to be working on solar radio astronomy. I was doing solar, uh, solar astronomy, and, uh, and the Air Force had a very good solar radio astronomy set up in Sacramento Hill in, mm. uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and the Air Force has long been interested in communication and how that can be disrupted by solar flare. So there's been a lot of Air Force support of solar research. And while I was there, they, they had a big 
antenna 150 feet across standing there more or less unused so I said can I can I use that and um, uh, and of course I could I had to get a security clearance it's the only time I ever had a security clearance <laughs> but we brought in some uh, some colleagues who knew more about the radio astronomy and we started uh, doing this uh, this work on on long wavelength radio astronomy and the most important problem was to try to detect interstellar uh, deuterium uh, with it uh, and at that time, uh, interestingly, um, I had some observations of solar flares in the radio part of the spectrum, and I brought in uh, uh, somebody I'd heard of at that time, uh, a fellow named Tom Kuiper, uh, who was at the University of Maryland. We wrote a paper together back in 1972. Well, Tom Kuiper turns out to be on the staff of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, which has a 34-meter radio telescope that we're going to use together for uh, the, the uh, annular eclipse of the sun mm. that's uh, coming up in a few weeks. So uh, we, I hope we have these two papers together with that 40 year interval um, between them. Uh, but a lot of these things have just been linked by, by equipment. I've had a certain kind of equipment that, that worked in a certain way or was at a certain location and uh, turned out to be useful You've really in, made the most in, in of the equipment way too. you've had access to. Sure, I, uh, I was studying in particular the heating of the solar corona uh, at eclipses, and we had a, a special kind of fast camera uh, uh, that way, and NASA supported fast camera, and I was very glad this week my NASA grant was renewed for the next three years. Congratulations. To, thank you, to <laughs> continue these, these studies. So I, uh, a friend of mine was using a similar camera to study the atmospheres of outer planets, Pluto and the things beyond mm -hmm. uh, Pluto, and uh, uh, and so we started studying when Pluto was a planet, and now we keep studying with, with what are called these, these dwarf planets. Uh, and it, it started because the uh, equipment used to study that was the same camera, different filter, but the same camera. And these are interesting scientific questions that I've been having a lot of fun working on. I think um, the, was it the American Astronomical Society, when they gave you your 2003 education prize, it was, among other things, for your intense advocacy on behalf of science education, your willingness to go into, quote, educational nooks, which is a bit of what we're getting into. Um, I want to ask you a bit more about science education, though. You've been involved with the Astronomy Education Review, with the American Association of Physics Teachers. What do you feel is the biggest challenge with um, Canadian, American, uh, let's say, North American education, or astronomy education today? What, are, what aren't we doing right? Well, a point that I've been making all along that I still think is important is we have to teach the most interesting things, or at least let the students know that the most interesting things are available. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my articles is called What to Teach, What to Learn. It's, it's quite um, obvious when you think about it that what we professors are teaching are not necessarily what the students are, are learning. You, right. have to, you have to match uh, what we're providing with what they actually uh, want. And my idea is that there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in astronomy. Uh, we have these eclipses, we have these transits, we have these black holes that even second graders uh, ask about. Uh, we have thousands of planets around other stars. But too often the curriculum in the schools, the elementary schools, the junior high schools, the, the high schools, uh, have a few basic topics. Uh, I've railed in particular against all the effort being put on teaching the phases of the moon and seasons. And, the moon's going to have the phases whether third graders or mm -hmm. seventh graders understand every aspect of it. It turns right. out to be a complex uh, problem in three-dimensional geometry that, that students have a lot of trouble with. And, uh, and yet the curriculum says that teaching even galaxies before the ninth grade is, is a complex idea. It's not concrete and, and shouldn't be done. So I think we ought to meet the desires and needs of the uh, elementary students at, at all grades, elementary, junior high, high, uh, to, uh, to find out what's really going on in, in modern science and what the interesting problems are and why we scientists find them, find them interesting. And I keep asking uh, when I see a, a curriculum, and I've just been on a, a K-12 curriculum uh, c a committee, I keep asking what's new in this that that they didn't know 100 years ago. What's new in this that they didn't know 200 years ago? And when, and when the whole allotment for physical science or the whole allotment for astronomy is, 
is Kepler's laws, which I dearly love, or Newton's law of gravitation, then I think there's a deficiency, and we ought to be uh, be teaching more about the exciting modern stuff, or at least a good fraction of the time doing that. I guess one of the dangers is if we don't teach it properly, then uh, people can be uh, seduced by the pseudosciences. And you teach a course in science and pseudoscience. Is this re- is this related to astronomy? Is there a lot of pseudo astronomy that needs to people need to be educated about? Well, sure, sure. There've been a lot of, of uh, pseudoscience related to astronomy. The whole all of astrology uh, is. Uh, is something that not, that not everybody in the general public properly uh, pr- properly uh, disassociates from right, sure. uh, fr- uh, from real science. Um, so uh, th- there was, especially 30, 40 years ago, a big fight over this guy Velikovsky, who mm-hmm. who claimed that Venus was jumping around and a comet hit it, uh, etc. Uh, and, and people didn't have a real scientific background to to tell these things apart. So there was a debate about Velikovsky, for example, decades ago. Do you just ignore it? Do we professional astronomers just ignore it? Uh, Or do you actually tackle it head on? And I guess I belong to the activist group that believes when there's something going on like uh, uh, like a a belief in astrology or or belief in the things Velikovsky was uh, was saying, which were not scientifically backed at all, that that we should deal with these problems. Uh, In fact, in the general teaching of science, and astronomy in particular, uh, for the last uh, few years, there's been a real realization that the students are not blank slates, Mm -hmm. that they have misconceptions, and just teaching good stuff or making good stuff available doesn't mean that their misconceptions will be overcome. And sometimes these are very powerful misconceptions, and and, um, and it's in the, in the function of the universe or the, or the phases of the moon or, or whatever else. And, and so you do have to show why these things are wrong or, or make students figure out the consequences of some of these beliefs, which then they will see come out to, to be something incorrect. And maybe in some cognitive dissonance, they'll, uh, a cognitive dissonance, mm-hmm. they will, um, they will uh, realize uh, that, these, that these are wrong ideas. But So it's not just enough to to provide the, the new information. You do have to tackle the misconceptions, and, and these misconceptions include a lot of pseudoscience. Are you hopeful for the future, as far as astronomy educates people's understanding and awareness of the world around them? I'm always hopeful, but there's, uh, there's an awful lot to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, <clears throat> am worried uh, about the, the lack of respect that people have for teachers. And I see these uh, these teachers being uh, railed against, and and now in some cities they're being evaluated by the students, and the scores are being released publicly. Really? Um, uh, how are you going to get good teachers to go into uh, an underpaid profession right. if they're not treated with uh, with a lot of uh, with a lot of respect? Uh, and uh, and we don't only want only brash, outspoken teachers who don't care what the students uh, say about them or, or what appears in the newspaper about them, but you have some sensitive people who we want to, to be uh, teachers. We want them not to all be investment bankers. We want the smartest people to go and be teachers, uh, but yet, uh, but yet we, don't, we don't treat them right and we don't make the conditions right for the best people to go into teachers. So the ones who are there are often very dedicated people, and, and I meet in my educational role some some great high school teachers of of physics of uh, of astronomy, uh, and and we want we want more people uh, like that to choose to go into teaching instead of mm-hmm. uh, instead of something else. Certainly. My last question for you: Can you just remind us when this transit of Venus is happening? Because it's the last one for what over a hundred years. Can you tell um, us when it's happening, you know, how it's being celebrated, where people can get more information on all that. Well, and, and to be optimistic, let me, let me say that I view advances in medicine coming out, so some l- little children today might well be able to see the one in 105 years in 2117. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so, uh, so I'd like the people with young children to take them out and photograph them next to some projection of the transit, so when the little kid grows up in 115 years, they'll say, look, and I saw this one too by my parents held me up. Uh, but the transit will be the evening of June 5th, uh, it will be in the late after uh, in the late afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, you 
It is projected against the sun, so you do need a special filter to look at it safely right. uh, or to have the image projected. They're going to have the stadium open at the University of Toronto for people to come and, and, and look. The university has bought uh, 48,000 filters to distribute uh, around. These are inexpensive things, uh, but you can't look safely at the sun uh, unless it's very, very low in the sky and, and sufficiently dimmed by the low atmosphere by uh, all the atmosphere it's, it's looking through. So so you do want to be sure you're looking at it safely. But but uh, intellectually, uh, it's just a fascinating thing to see this this thing that has only happened in 1639 and then 1761, 1769, 1874, 1882, mm -hmm. and then 2004. So we've only had these six transits. Uh, it's a really rare event. It's a really rare event. And it will be celebrated, I'm sure, around the world. Or actually, where where in the in the world will it be uh, visible to be celebrated? Well, the most of the world will be able to see at least part of it. Okay. And we only see a little less than half of it here in Toronto. Um, the zone in which you can see it all goes from Hawaii through Asia and Australia. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see the end of it here in, in Europe. They'll see uh, the beginning of it, um, we're, and I want to be in the zone where I can see it all, which is where we're going to watch from. I'm very jealous. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the transit, and I want to thank you, uh, Professor Jay Pasikoff, for joining us here at the Star Spot. Well, thank you for an interesting set of questions. It's been a, a lot of fun to talk to you. Thank you for joining us at the Star Spot, mind and universe continually expanding. The Star Spot with Justin Trottier is an astronomy and space themed podcast based out of Toronto, Canada. Please send comments or questions to starspotpodcast at gmail.com. The Star Spot is produced by Ying Zhang Li, marketing and promotions by Natalie Morcos, guest news and voiceover by Amanda Gadke, research by Alexander Gurevich, web design by Blair Renault, graphics by Carmina Svillens. And I'm your host, Justin Trottier. Thank you for listening. <laughs>